Um, social media is at DJ Thorough, and that's spelled, the Thorough is spelled T-H-O-R-O. -O. It's spelled, you know, it's ebonically spelled. It's like hip hop shit, so. DJ Thorough, that's how you spell that. All right, I'm from New York City. Dope, dope, got New York in the building, bro. All right. So like, take them, let's, let's go back, like, bro, like, uh, growing up in New York, what part of New York you from in, um... Uh, Harlem. 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 Okay, yeah, we hear Harlem, a lot about man. Harlem, bro. Yeah, you know, Harlem is, Harlem is, Harlem in itself is legendary, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously been legendary before we, 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 were, we were in existence, you know, from the fashion, to the culture, to the people, to the talk, to the walk, you know, it's just, it's just a legendary place to be. Musicians, you know, um, going all the way back to the late 20s and 30s, you know, Harlem is just a historical place for, for black people. That's, that's one of the um, places where black people migrated to from the South after, you know, after slavery. A lot of people came to New York, you know, well, majority of black people came to New York, you know, from, that's why everybody, from, from, that's why everybody from New York got a cousin from South Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, somewhere, everybody. You know, because that's that's basically our roots are from the south. The east side or west side? West side. One thirty fifth and Lennox. Right. Yeah. My Lennox Terrace area. Lennox Terrace, that's exactly where I'm from. Yeah. Lennox Terrace. <laughs> right. You hit it you hit it dead on the head. Lennox right. Terrace. You know what I mean? But I lived all over Harlem, Polo Grounds, Colonial, uh Morningside, you know. It, there was a point where, you know, a lot of people don't know Tupac used to live on 123rd. And Morningside, I used to live on 121st in Morningside. And I used to see him all the time. So, like, coming up, your upbringing, like, what was you, like, was you into music? Was you into, um, what was you into coming up, bro? Like, um, your teenage years? Yeah, well, you know, when, when I was coming up, I was into, I was actually into two things. I was into motorcycles, or well, three things, motorcycles, bikes, and music. That's, that's mainly, all my life, that's what I've been into. And... And I would always do them together. Like I would ride my bike, listening to music, or or ride a motorcycle, listening to music. So I was it was always music and bikes for me. Like in my teenage years. So even in my teenage years, I used to actually race BMX or whatever. And I was one, you know, back when I was doing it, it wasn't many people of color doing it or whatever. And especially being in New York or whatever, it's really nobody in New York racing BMX like that outside of um like in like, like Queens. A lot of riders was in Queens and Long Island. But it was really nobody in Harlem racing BMX or whatever. There, there are there are a few people that was racing BMX, like Superman. Uh, he, he used to race. You know, he's a legendary cat, um, cat on the um, with the motorcycle. So a lot of people come from BMX that race motorcycles. Like this, that's a big culture in um, in New York itself right now. The, you know, the dirt bikes. But a lot of that came from riding BMX bikes first. So I was heavy into that. I, I still am into it. But that was my that was my love. My first love had always been my love music and bikes. Dope, dope, dope. So like you know, it's different levels of hip hop, and um, you know, your name being DJ Thero, like, how did you end up getting into that? Was that through uh, early years being yeah, a see, DJ? It's, yeah, it's funny that name. That name actually came from my mother. Um, when I was eight years old, I was multi. I um, I was um, multi talented in sports. So at, when I was eight, like from eight to like my teenage years, I used to actually play football. I played soccer. I played baseball, and I played basketball. And she was like, "Damn, you're thorough. You you you, you play. You do everything." And it, it just stuck with me. So my mother gave me that name when I was eight, and I and I had it ever since. She don't even call me my real name. She called me Thorough. So that's 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 it. <laughs> it just stuck with me. So everything I do, I try to do exactly what that name means, Thorough. I try to be well-rounded, and and try to be the best I can be at it. So that's kind of what that name is about. Dope, dope. And where did where did the DJ come from? Like you started DJing? Or? Yeah, I started DJing. So anything I did, I, you know, obviously I needed a DJ name. So I, I you know, I'm thorough. So I'm DJ Thorough. I, I just attached. I just put a DJ in front of my name or whatever. But the way I got into DJing, it goes back to me riding bikes, listening to music, and what I would be listening to, you know, in my teenage years, in my, in my younger years, or what, or what have you. Um, even in elementary school, I, I would listen to Red Alert. I credit Red Alert and Marley Mall as the two people that that made me who I am today in terms of wanting to be a DJ and the standard of being a DJ. So every every Saturday, see, people take for granted. Now, hip-hop is on the radio right now 24 hours a day. Like, right now it's on. You can turn on Hot 97, uh, 105, whatever. It's, it's a hip-hop record on right now. But when I was coming up as a kid, 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, hip-hop only came on on weekends. It was a rap attack show. Mr. Magic was on WBLS, and Red Alert was on Kiss FM. 
So you would only hear hip hop on Saturday, um, excuse me, on Friday and Saturday. That's the only time you would hear it on the radio. And, you know, we would literally like take tapes and record the radio, which people don't do that no more, but that was then. And um, that's where my interest became and in wanted to be a DJ because I was fascinated by like how they were cutting, scratching, how they were blending songs in, how they would transition to one song to another, how they would take a beat and an acapella and, and, and then create a whole new record. Like I was fascinated by that and I would always visualize how they were doing that. And a funny story is I actually taught myself how to DJ by just mimicking what I was hearing rather than doing the tapes. I would just like practice what I was hearing until I figured out how to do it. It took me longer to learn how to DJ because no one, no one really showed me how to do it. So, but I literally, I could say, literally, Red Alert literally taught me how to DJ without teaching me physically. I just listened to him, and that's how I learned how to DJ. So, like, being a DJ, you know, what you doing, like, parties? Like, um... Uh, when, how, I first, when, I, when, I, when I first did it, I was just doing it for fun. And then um, I came up in a mixtape era. When I, when, I, when I first started DJing, mixtapes was big. So you had, like, Ron G, you had Clue, you had Brucey e. B, you had K Capri, Craig G... Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, Envy, uh, Flex, you know, that's the era I came in, up, up in, you know, DJing or whatever. So, um, that's, I figured, well, you know, to make a name for myself, I need to start doing mixtapes. So, actually, my first mixtape was in 1999. That was my first mixtape I did. And, um, I, you know, there was a magazine, everybody knows about the Feds magazine. So, I actually took the cover of the Feds magazine and I put myself on there, on the cover of the Feds magazine, because I was into the street shit, like, in terms of the music. Like, I like, my whole playlist is, you know, street shit. I, I didn't really do R&B at the time, and, and blends. I was just, like, hardcore bars and street shit, you know what I mean? So I took, I took the cover of the Feds magazine, put myself on the cover, and that was my first mixtape cover. It was called Happy Thoroughs, yeah. That was my first cover, I ever, my first mixtape I did. And that's how I got, that's how I started making a name for myself, through the mixtapes. Dope, dope. So like, when, what, what did you think, like, how many years did it take you for you to like, to really get involved into like the DJ, like where you say your name was moving around, like even Harlem, New right. York City? Um, it took about, I'll say when I knew I was making some noise, it took about, I would say, it took about two years. Two, after two years of putting mixtapes out. And I got a credit, um, I got a shout out on DJ Capone too, cause he, he was doing mixtapes too. So he used to take me around to all the mixtape spots or whatever and show me, you know, what spots to sell mixtapes. So I, I definitely credit credit him for helping me, um, you know, get my name out there with mixtapes or whatever. Um, I, I don't like to leave people out of my, my story, you know, especially if they was a part of it. That's one thing I like to give people their credit. Um, but I, when I realized I was making an impact was the day I met Ray Korn from Wu-Tang Clan. And that was, um, I met him on 125th Street this was like 2001 is when we met. And um, he was coming out of the weed spot. And I was out there, uh, I, was on a, I was selling mixtapes. I was outside selling mixtapes. And then when I saw him, I was like, yo, I'm DJ Thurow. You know, I do mixtapes. You know, I, I, I want to know if you can you know, host my mixtape. And he was like, yeah, I know who you are. Like, and I was like, I was surprised that he knew who I was. So I'm like, damn, you know who I am? He's like, yeah, I know who you are. So then he was like, take my number. He said, as a matter of fact, I need a DJ to go on a roll with me. This is exactly how this happened. He said, I need a DJ to go on a roll with me. He said, he said, are you available? I'm like, yeah, I'm available. So he's like, take my number and come to Staten Island tomorrow. And um, I took his number. The next day I called him. He's like, yo, come out here to Staten Island because we get ready to go on a roll and I want to talk to you. I went to Staten Island. Uh, I met with him and he told me, yo, so this is my, um, this is my um, third album. It was the Lex Diamond story album he was doing. It was his third album. And he's like, yo, I need a, I need a real DJ. I need somebody I can cut. I need a, basically, he said, I need a real DJ. I, I need somebody that know how to DJ because you're going to have your own set. You're going to you know, do your DJ tricks and you know, all that. I came up in that era where you had to really know how to DJ. You, know, you had to know how to do tricks. You had to know how to cut. You, know, you had to know how to scratch. Not just play music. See, people confuse DJing with playing music. There's a difference between playing music and DJing. So he said, no, I need a DJ. I don't need nobody to play music. So he just wanted to make sure I get busy in that aspect. So I showed him what I could do. So he's like, yo, you got the job. And it happened like that. And that's when I realized, damn, I, I was, you know, I really, I really made it, you know, in, in those two short years, those mixtapes panned off because if it wasn't for the mixtapes, he probably would have never knew who I was.
So I credit everything to the mixtape thing. And Did you get with them before Chip Banks got down with them? Um, it was kind of in that era, yeah. It was right same in that era, yeah, time. yeah, same time. But Chip, Chip died like right, right, right. When, yeah, right when I was getting with him. Chip, you know, obviously, unfortunately, I can say obviously, unfortunately, Chip, you know, he passed away or whatever. But it was right in that era, right there, when I got with him. The cream, the cream team, that's what the that was. Cream was team. The cream team. Right. Yep. Yep. Was this during the time when like turntables were still around when it came yeah, to we, DJ? Yeah, there, yeah, there was no Serato yet. It was no Serato yet. It was still vinyl. We were still carrying records. Yep. It was it, there was no Serato yet. It was still vinyl. So imagine, you know, we doing parties, man. We were carrying like 10, 14 crates of records to do a party. And I was going on road. That was the worst because you know we flying everywhere. So I got to lug six or seven crates on a plane with me everywhere. So it, it was. It was a struggle, but that, that was a rough era with the DJ shit. You, you, you had to be strong back then. You had to be in shape. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, yeah, that was before Serato. All of this was before Serato. Uh, so, like, doing that so doing that tour, like, um, did, did you start to cultivate different relationships throughout the industry? Like, can you talk about some of the relationships? Yeah. Um, I, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know... Um, do you know Proof from uh, D12? You know, God mm -hmm. bless the day. I don't know if you know who. So Proof is my cousin or whatever. It's, um, so um, it's a funny story. When, um, nobody knew he was my cousin. Ray didn't even know. So when we went to, um, he, he went to Detroit. My, by the way, this is my first time going on tour, like, you know, with an artist or whatever. I had been, you know, traveling before, but not for music. Um, this is my first time going on the road. Like I said, Ray, I credit Ray Kwan too. He gave me my first shot, you know what I mean? He threw me on a major stage, though. You know what I mean? I, most people, it's a stepping stone. You go from a little artist. Or, I went straight to a major artist on a big stage in front of th 10, 20,000 of people in the stadiums. Like, you know, then I was doing shows with Wu-Tang. So he just threw me out there like, yo, you know, he, he trusted me, you know, with, with this whole set. You know what I mean? And um, hold on, I'm doing this interview. Hold on. Yeah. So he, um, he trusted me with his whole set. So he just threw me out there in the fire, so to speak. But, um... Uh, yeah, I was building relationships. We, um, when we went to Detroit, this, this is the first time I was there when Raekwon and Eminem met, or whatever. So I was there for that. I actually have, I, have, I actually have this on footage, that when um, Ray and Eminem met, and then Proof was like, "Yo, you know what? Thorough was my cousin. Y'all don't know that, right?" So everybody's like sitting there with their, like shocked with their mouth open, like, "Yeah, this is my this is my cousin right here. Y'all didn't even know that." So I made a lot of um, allies and. Um, relationships, you know, being on tour. I met a lot of DJs, a lot of program directors, a lot of artists, and that created my network. But more importantly, I was still doing mixtapes, right? So every town I went to, the stores that I wasn't in, I would run up in the stores. So that expanded my, my, um, my networking system. Like, so I had a mixtape in every city because we did a 50 city tour. So I literally had 100 mixtapes, at least 100 mixtapes in every 50 state we went to. So I was really, you know, caking off at that time, you know, with the mixtapes. So. Dope, dope. I think you went out. Everybody that's associated with that, they want me to DJ for them. So it got me mad work. Yeah, yo, Taro. You're uh, getting a phone yeah, call. Nature. All right. To, to do my own thing. Um, can you back it up about a minute? Because I think you was getting a phone call. We didn't hear you. Oh, you didn't hear what I was saying? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was saying that um, just being on tour in general, it really helped, took my career to another level because when I was going to these different states, I was still doing mixtapes. So I would make sure I put at least 100 mixtapes in every store that I went to in stores in general in all 50 states. So that expanded my networking system and I really started making you know, a lot of money and I started getting booked crazy because people see me on stage at Ray, now they want me to do a party. Now they want me to DJ for them. Now they want to fly me here. Now they want to fly me here. So DJing for him, it just took me to a whole nother level to do my own thing. Dope, dope. Tell us about like what was now what was your next big tour? Um, my next big tour was um when I got with when I got with um when I started DJing for 50 Cent or whatever. And that was um that was overseas. And the way I got that job, uh, I got a shout out Money Nelson. Um, he was um, at the time he was um, role managing um, 50 Cent or whatever, and um, he just called me one day. I, I used to DJ with him. He hired me to DJ on Shade 45. That's how I got on Shade 45. He hired me to DJ on Shade 45. So one day he just called me. He was like, "Yo, come to the office." He didn't even tell me why. I didn't even ask why. I just went to the office, and when I went in the office, 
50 Cent was there. And he was like, I was like, oh shit. And I'm saying to myself, what's, what's going on here? What's up? So he's like, yo, 50, you need a DJ. At the time, he, you know, Who Kid was always 50's DJ. And, you know, um, what, you know, for whatever reason, Who Kid wasn't going to do the job no more. So he was like, yo, I need you to, I need you to DJ. I need you to go on a roll. Um, this is what I need. Blah, 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 whatever, whatever. So I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. So, um, yeah, my first tour with 50 was in Norway. We went to Norway. We went to Ireland. I went to Russia. Um, we was in London. Uh, where else I went? I went to um, Indonesia and I went to Brazil. That's the first time I went on. That's like my first meeting with 50. Those are the places I went to. So, and you know, at the time dealing with Fifth, Fifth, you know, obviously was one of the biggest artists to ever do it. We were doing stadiums, like you know, we would do like football stadiums. You know, if you can imagine. A lot of rappers, a lot of hip hop artists, they don't do stadiums. They do clubs and, and big venues and halls, but they're not doing like um, it's the equivalent. It's the equivalent to him playing giant stadiums. Like that's the type of places we were doing, like overseas. You know what I mean? And a lot of artists, they don't experience that. And just to be thrown on stage with that type of um, with that many people, at, you know, I'm not really a nervous person or get anxiety, but that was like one of the first times I started like getting nervous, like. Yeah, like almost questioning was I ready for this because it was like it was like a it was like a culture shock. I never did a crowd that big before, but you know I got over the butterflies and um, ever since then you know I've been rocking. I'm good. Yo, how you and your whole kid used to work out like the DJ? Oh, schedule. it's funny because um, uh, it was funny because uh, when I first started, who kid was he was uh I, I want to say he was training me, but he was just showing me how to how to schedule how to how the order goes. So I would literally like 50 such a um a, um a, 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 how you call it. He's such a prepared person. So he hired me to, to go with Who Kid to watch him DJ, watch him do the set for like three months. I just went on the road. I wasn't even DJing. He just wanted me to stand there with Who Kid and watch him and learn, and, learn, and learn the order. So for three months, I went on the road before that just to watch Who Kid do the shows with 50. And I was just standing there and watch and learn the order. That's the type of person 50 Cent is. And another, another thing I learned about 50 is um, I try to be always punctual and on time. A lot of people don't realize 50, man, he's the most punctual person in the business. Like, if there's if the show is at one o'clock, 50's gonna be there at 12 o'clock. He's, this man is early for everything. And you would think somebody of that status, you know, um, most people of that status, they got a, um, a, 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 what do you call it? A reputation for being a diva or always being late or always been a problem. Now he's the, he's the complete opposite of that. And I, and, I, and I learned a lot from him. And I will always say, I see why you're where you are. And a lot of people with talent, they're not where they need to be. It's the worth ethnic and, and, and how you, you know, how you treat your craft. So I learned a lot from him in, in terms of being punctual, taking things serious, and being on time. So this 0405, yeah. like the height of 50? This is uh no, this is oh this is 08, 09, 50. This is when I when I went on the road. This is Curtis, this is Curtis album. Oh, the Curtis album, okay. Yeah, this is yeah, this is Curtis album. And Matt, this is the Massacre and Curtis album. Yeah, I was gonna say Massacre too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that, that album. Yeah. Or shit is dope. So like being around G Unit, you know, uh, at the time, like, did you did you have any issues being like a DJ with G Unit? Nah, nah. Because like they, you know, yeah, what, yeah, what they, they had yeah, going they, on. Yeah, beef. Yeah, I just from some, I was always diplomatic, bro. I never, I never got in, you know. I never got involved in nobody's beef, or he never put me in anybody in, 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 in any beef either. You know what I mean? I was there to DJ, not be involved with a beef he had that I, but I didn't even know him. It, it didn't work like that with Fifty. He doesn't. That's not how it was. So we, I never encountered any any beef, any problems DJing with DJing for him or outside of him, or just being affiliated with him. It was nothing but good vibes and a good time. So I never I never experienced that. No. Dope, dope, dope. Yo, so what song? What song? was turned up out there that 50 had. Like from each album, which song tore the house down? Well, it's kind of like the same songs here. You know, his big his big songs, you know. In the um, club. In the club. If, yeah, that's his biggest record. If I can't, you know what I mean? Even the records he got with Game, Hate It or Love It, and This Is How We Do. Um, it's, it's the same stuff here, you know what I mean? And um, even um, Have a Baby By Me. Actually, Have a Baby By Me is one of the biggest records in overseas to this day. Like that's one of his biggest records out there but pretty much all the classics it's the same it's universal you know what i mean it's, it's all it's universal that's one thing about the internet everything that's popping here is pretty much what's popping everywhere and you could thank the internet for that now because you know that's just how it is now the internet made every place one big city now 
So it's pretty much the same records that's that's popping here. That's that, that turns everything up. So like um you know this I think this is fifty was around then right? Uh, it was just it was it had been around, but I didn't get on I didn't get on this is fifty until like two thousand eight two thousand nine, which is how my affiliation with that is how I got you know in contact with fifty and being able to DJ for fifty because um, like I said, Money Nelson he hired me to do this is fifty, he hired me to do Shade forty five, and then he put me on with fifty to do um, the DJ for him, and I still you know I still been you know attached to the company ever since I'm still there. So how did you transition from like a DJ to a media personality? Uh, it's the same thing. It's just being credible and being experienced. It's almost like um, how Shannon Sharp is a commentary now about sports. Well, Shannon Sharp is a Hall of Fame football player. It's the same thing. I, I participated in a sport we call hip-hop or this culture we call hip-hop. So I have credible knowledge about it. I'm experienced about it. I sit on the biggest stages with the biggest artists. So I have stories and I can, you know, you know, I have things that matter to talk about. You know what I mean? So I have content to talk about, you know? So I have relatable content to talk about. I have... Um, I have um, a teachable content to talk about, you know. So that's that's how it was. It's an easy transition. It goes hand in hand. Your experiences allow you to be able to do these type of shows and talk about things because you did it. The things the artists are trying to do now, uh, do do a show at Wembley Stadium. Uh, I, I, I performed the, at the Apollo. I, I did every venue, any, every stage you can think of. I did it. Summer Jam. I, I did everything. So. Those experiences allow me to stand on the stage and, and basically be a commentary to the sport now because I'm a participant of it. You know what I mean? Got you. And like you said, you know, going on tour with 50, you kind of got nervous because of the, you know, the size of the, the venue. Yeah, but, I, had um, never, I had never did a crowd that big before. Like when it came to interviewing artists, I know that this is 50. They had quite a few different artists come through there. And uh, yeah. was it any artists that made you feel like that? Uh, I'm always I always look at myself as an equal, you know what I mean? So I never I never um and that comes from when I used to play football uh, sports, you know. Even people I used to look up to when it's time to go on the field with them, we equals. Or oh, I'm better than them. That's how that's my mindset. So I never look at nobody like I need to be nervous to talk to them because they equal like me. I know just as much as they do, if not more. So that was always my mindset, even to this day, when I'm dealing with somebody. I'm doing an interview, hold on. Yeah. Got you, got you. So, what was what was the interview that um that went viral? That first time you went viral. Um, I would say one of the ones I did was um, I would say with Cam. You know, I'm the I'm the one that got Cam and Fifty to talk again. Um, and we did it the day we did the interview or whatever. And um, if, you know, obviously everybody know Cam and Fifty had an issue. I ain't gonna say a beef because it wasn't no real physical beef. It was a rap beef, whatever. And um, I'm the one that um bridged the gap. You know, I brought. It was it was a funny story with that interview. I mean, with that um, how that happened because maybe for three months, Cam was kept asking me, "Yo, you sure Fifty said I could come up there? You sure it's cool?" And I'm like, "Yeah, bro. You think I'm not? You think I'm trying to line you up and set you up? Like, yeah, I'm coming with you. Like, we, like I'm I'm there too. Like, yeah." He said, "Come to the office." So I could tell Cam was kind of skeptical to come up there. So it kind of took him like two to three years. I had to literally get them on the phone together. Like, I I had to literally call Fifth and put him and Cam on the phone and they talked. And then I guess he felt comfortable. Then he went up there. So, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, ain't gonna, I, I, I basically got them to talk, and he came up there. They squashed whatever differences they had, and he did the interview. And then, you know, that 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 that, that whole thing went, you know, went pretty viral or whatever. And then that, that was one of my biggest interviews. That I would say, Master P. Like I pretty much interviewed everybody, man. Like I'm the first person to interview the baby, you know. Um, and this was before his name was the baby. His name was ba the baby Jesus, baby Jesus. You know what I mean, I did. I did a lot of people's first interview. Even French Montana, I did his first interview. I did a lot of people's first before they really, you know, go where they need to go. So I like to credit myself on that. You know what I mean? So, but I've done a lot of interviews. I pretty much interview any and everybody. Only person I probably haven't interviewed is Jay Z or whatever and Eminem. But I pretty much interview everybody. And like, what's your um, when you like when you doing interviews? Do you write down the questions? Um... Like what's your process? Nah, I do. You know what I do? I do what I call. I don't even do interviews. I do. I do conversations. So I never write nothing down. I don't even know what I'm gonna say until I, until they're sitting there with me, because I don't like doing scripted interviews. You know what I mean? So if you look at my interviews, none of them are the same because the people that I'm interviewing are not the same. Everybody's different. So I don't ask like, okay, this question, that question. I never do that. I just have a conversation, and well, however it came out, that's how it come out, and that's my formula. That's how I do interviews. I just have conversations. I don't write nothing down. I don't have premeditate anything. I don't do this is like just like this. I don't know what you're gonna ask me, but whatever it is, I'm gonna just answer it, and that's it.
I got a follow up question to that, right? Um, What's up? Since you did, I said I have a follow up question to that. Okay. Since you like deal with like um, artists, right? Mm -hmm. um, have you, they ever asked you to submit questions? Because I know yeah, sometimes yeah. artists do that. <laughs> Yeah, they do and that. How and do I, you dodge that? How do I you dodge or answer I re, that? I, re, I respectfully tell them I'm gonna cover everything you need to. I, I need to cover. No, no, don't worry. I got you. And I and I, and I'll say that. I say now, if you got a talking point, if it's something you want me to ask you that maybe I didn't ask, I'll ask him. I'm like, well, what do you want me to ask you? And they'll tell me. I'm like, well, bro, I was gonna ask you that anyway. You know what I mean? It's more, nine times out of ten, whatever they want me to ask them, I was gonna ask them anyway. That's that's what happens a lot. And I'll tell them I was gonna I was gonna ask you that anyway. So when that, when I tell them that, they kind of relax and like, all right, cool. I'm like, yo, trust me. I'm gonna ask you everything under the sun. And if there's something left out, you're gonna get the opportunity. You're gonna have you're gonna have the opportunity to talk about it. But don't like respectfully. Don't tell me what, what to ask you. I don't like doing interviews like that. No, if, you, if it's something, if it's something, you, have you ever missed an opportunity because you you told them that you don't have any questions to give? Like, nah, nah. Has nobody I haven't. been like, nah, forget it then, because I nah, need to know. Nah, nobody did. Nobody did that. No, nope, nobody did that. Maybe I think maybe maybe one person, but if most of the time it's people that's I, don't, I never call nobody nobodies, but most of the time it's like independent artists that's that that has a um that has like some whatever entitlement issue they have. But they'll be like, oh, when I come up there, I'm not rapping. So when they say that, I'll be like, well, don't come. And that's that. Because my show is based off talent, music, and why you're actually doing it. It's not like shit outside of music. You know what I mean? My, my platform is based on actual music. Like, I don't care about dumb shit and ignorant shit. I mean, that's not why you're up here. That's, I mean, that's not why you're in this business. So I kind of shy away from that. It's enough platforms that cover that. I don't really cover that. So my shit is about the music. And, and and your talent. If you say you and if you say you're a rapper, if you if you then you got to come up there and prove it because that's what my show is based off of. So if someone tells me that, I would tell them respectfully, don't come. I'm not interested. I don't care who it is. You know, listen. I made Master P rap. I don't know if you know anything about Master P, but he don't do that. I made Master P rap. He tried to get out of it, but he did it. So. You know, you're talking about somebody sold 350 million records. So, I, like I said, I have everybody on my show, and they all rap. Everybody, from the legends to the, whoever's hot right now, everybody. Everybody. So, that's what I pride myself on, and that's, you know, that's what I stand on. And if somebody don't want to do it, that's cool. Like, I don't have a problem with it. They, that's their choice. They don't have to do it. But to answer to your question, uh, I, never, I never had a problem with anybody not wanting to come to my show because I said I wasn't going to. Um, take the question they wanted me to ask. So, no, nah, I never had that problem. And did, like, during this time, did you stop DJing or um, did you slow down on DJing? Nah, or nah, was it I never, the same? I never, only, I never stopped DJing. I, was, I slowed down DJing just like the whole world did when the pandemic hit. That's the only time I stopped for two years. You know, nobody DJ for two years. I didn't DJ for two years. Prior to that, like I said, because of my dealings with 50, Ray Corey, you know, I DJ for Cassidy. I DJ for Jazzo. Um, I've DJ for Lloyd Tariq. Um, I've done I've done a lot. I've, I've been on the road with a lot of artists. Uh, the Beat Nuts. Um, so because of all of my affiliation with all these artists, prior to that, prior to the pandemic, I was overseas every weekend, like doing my own tours. I, I do my own club tours overseas. I had a residency in Geneva, Switzerland, at the casino. Every every Saturday, I was I fly to Switzerland to DJ. So I never never stopped DJing. It just slowed down after the pandemic. Now that everything's clearing back up. I'm back overseas, back in Dubai. I'm the first DJ, I'm the first American DJ, I'm gonna say first DJ, I'm the first DJ in America to go to Israel, um, Beersheba, Israel to DJ. Nobody from America to this day has been there to DJ yet. I'm the first DJ to do that. And I went to Jerusalem and did all this stuff, you know, Tel Aviv, Israel. No DJs ever went over there before me to, to DJ. So um, I'm still DJing, I never stopped. Dope, dope, dope. And um, I'm going to give it to the floor to see if they got any questions. Um, anybody got any questions? No questions. Well, I no asked questions. who's your top five DJs that you learned from and why. Ah, oh, great what question. What was it about their set or their, their skills? And did uh, you adopt that into your style? Yeah, of course. Um, all right, so my top five DJs would be... Um, now, if we're talking... Um, 
we talking parties, mixtapes, because you know you got to break down in the genres these days. Because there's party DJs, there's mixtape DJs, there's club DJs, there's radio DJs, there's um, battle DJs. But I'll say overall, who I learned from, who I took from, who I um, study, however you want to call it. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, who you learned from, yeah, who you took yeah, from, and what was it that you took on the... Right. Uh, well, first one, in terms of party, not going to party, I would say Kid Caprice. Um, I, what I got from Kid Capri is you can't be shy DD in a party. You got to be on the mic. You got to get involved. You got to um, learn how to read a room. And you got to know how to transition records. You know, you can't leave a record on too long and you can't leave a record on too short. And that's what I learned from Kid Capri. And you got to be well knowledgeable in music. You got to know how to play. Like me, I could go to Alabama right now and, and, and do, do a party. I could go to Puerto Rico and do a party. I could go to London and do a party. Obviously, I could go to New York and do a party. I can go to LA. I know every every genre of music and every region of music. I know what's hot. I know who's hot. I know the classics there. You know, I know the history of the music. I, I studied that. So whenever I go somewhere, I do my homework, you know, and I learn the music. I learn the people, you know. I know what was hot 20 years ago there. I know what was hot 10 years ago. I know what was hot five years ago. I, I know what's hot now. I make sure I know all these records because I'm going to implement that in my set. So when you're listening to me, DJ, I'm going to take you somewhere. You're not going to hear the same genre of music all night long. When you, when, I, when you come to where I'm DJing at, you, you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear everything, you know. I'm going to take you to your childhood. I'm going to take you, you're going to hear stuff you forgot about. You're going to hear stuff you, you want to know about. You know, you're going to hear stuff, you know, you wish you would have produced. Like, I'm just going to take you on a journey musically. You know what I mean? That's what I try to do. And I learned that from Kid Capri. Um, another DJ, obviously, like I said before, Red Alert. Red Alert is one of the DJs that um, I looked up to. Um, he, he, always, he always broke new music, you know what I mean? Like... He always he always made me want to say what's that record? So I always pride myself in playing and helping up and coming artists if you know if they have good music, you know what I mean? So I learned that from Red Alert. Uh, another another DJ, um, Clark Kent. Clark Kent is another good DJ. Um, same thing with Kid Capri. You know you got to know how to read a room. Um, you just gotta have your crates gotta be deep. You just gotta you gotta you gotta be knowledgeable in music outside of hip hop. A lot of people only know how to play is hip hop. They don't know any type of no other type of music. So if they go, they can't they can't get booked in Dubai. They can't get booked in Switzerland because all they know how to play is is, is house. I mean, is, is trap music. Well, when you go over there, that don't fly. You gotta you gotta know how to play Afrobeats. You gotta know dubstep. You gotta know house. You not you know you gotta know all this music that has nothing to do with hip hop when you go DJ. That's what being a DJ is about. So I credit those DJs, you know, for giving me a well-rounded um, sense of having having to be knowledgeable in music. You know, Clark Kent, Red Alert, um, Kid Capri, uh, Marley Mall, same thing, you know, same concept. You know, he, he plays a lot of new music. He plays a lot of hot new music. And I, I came up in an era where you had to know how to, well, I came up in the era of the DJ. The DJ is the producer. So when I came up, the music that was being played on the radio was being, was being produced by the same people that was playing it. And my example is DJ Premier. DJ Premier used to be on WBLS. So obviously everybody knows DJ Premier is a hell of a hell of a producer, and then you had Pete Rock. Everybody knows Pete Rock is a hell of a producer. He's the DJ also. Molly Mall, Molly Mall is a hell of a producer. He's the DJ also, and the list goes on and on and on. But my ultimate DJ producer is Dr. Dre. Like hands down, nobody's fucking with Dre. You know he's been around for four generations of hip hop from like you know from 40. He has a 40 year career and he's still relevant today. No one can say they did that. You know he. Like Dre's like Dre Dre is 40 years in this game, and people are still waiting for him to put an album out. You know he still matters. Like a lot of people, career don't even last three years. So I credit, and I, I look up to people like Dre. That's where I draw my inspiration from. Longevity. Like I want before I leave here, I want to like create a leg, a, a, leave a legacy of greatness behind, and, and create timeless music and just you know do, do timeless things. That's what I want to do. So I credit that to all those DJs that came before me, and I studied them. And I just try to implement that in what I do. So that's 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 my answer to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you ever transition like how like um, DJ Drummer and um, like Khaled had to like um, move over from like the mixtapes to they actually being actual albums? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got um, I got a project I'm doing now. It's called '80s Babies or whatever. I've been working on it for for actually a couple of years. But like I said, the pandemic slowed it down. But yeah, but see, I um. I actually produce too. Like, I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's that's, that's transition I was telling you. Like, I, I make beats too, you know. I, I just did, um, Cam just put a project out called You Wasn't There. I just did the single off there. The single is called Cheers. I produced that. 
or whatever. So I, st I make beats and, um, and, I, and I do all of it. I'm, ha I'm hands on, you know. So yeah, I, I definitely made that transition from 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 the mixtapes because you know obviously the mixtapes died out once the internet came in. So I actually put in together a real album with, with, with real artists and um, and um, you know and I'm gonna put it out. I did records with Young Dolph. I got records with Shanti. You know what I mean? Uh, or, or Shanti McCoy, who's on the, who's, who's um who's on the check in right now. I did records with Cassidy. I got records with Cassidy. I met up with um. With Raekwon, obviously. So I have a lot of records that I produce for people that's out and that's coming out. Got you, got you. And what, what else um, you got that's coming out? Oh, so yeah, right now, like I said just now, I have a project that I'm doing. It's called 80s Babies. And basically, it's, um, it's an album that I'm putting out of, um, of my production with some of my favorite artists. And on this album, I have Young Dolph, I got Raekwon, I got Jada Kiss, I got Styles P on that, I got Cameron, um, and a, a few others. I'm still working on it, and um, this is just basically me showcasing my my production skills in an album form, and that'll be coming out real soon. You know, I'm still finishing, putting the finishing touches on it. So that's what I. That's the next big thing I have coming out. Also, I have a, um, I have a um, company called the BBS Boys, and and I own a um, classic car. A classic car rental um, business where I rent out cars from the 80s and 90s for video shoots and movies um, and things of that nature. Um, I have a car called um, I have um, I don't know if you saw or I hope you saw it. You saw the movie Paid in Full, obviously, right? Right. Yep. Right. So I have that car. That Saab. I have that car. I have I have the black one and I have a red one. And um, so that that's the first car I did. That's what I used to start the company. So right now. I just did a deal with Dame Dash. We have a TV show called um, the BBS Voice for the Culture that's going to be coming out. It's either, it's either going to be on Netflix or Fox Soul or the Discovery Channel. We're pitching it right now. And that's where I am right now. I'm literally on set now. We're filming right now. And um, so you can look out for that. It's, um, if anybody, everybody that's listening right now, go to the page. It's at the BBS Boys, and you'll see all the cars. You'll see all the videos. Um, everybody's used our cars, man, from Rihanna, ASAP Rocky, Drake, Young Thug, um, um, Jim Jones, Davies, um, you name it. Everybody's used our cars. Everybody. And if you go to the page, you'll see all of that. It's, it's all documented. It's up on the page. So if anybody's looking for a classic car from the paid and full era, I'm talking Benzes, I'm talking um, BMWs, I'm talking NSXs, Acura Legends, Acura Coupes, Land yeah. Cruiser, Range Rover, whatever. You know what I mean? Just hit me up at um, you can hit me up personally at DJ Thorough or go to the page or the website. It's the BBS Boys. So just go straight to the, uh, the IG and, and shoot me a DM or whatever. And you can see all the cars. We have over 45 cars of classic cars from the 80s and 90s. Got you, got you. Dope, yeah. dope. So did you use any of those? Hi, my name is Opinionator. I'm um, sorry, say, did it, say it again. Say What's your name? Hi, my... <laughs> Opinionator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Okay. So, um, did you use any of the classic cars with Fifty and the making of you know yeah. that video? That yeah. If you look at if you look at Raising Canaan, those are our cars, and in, in, in Raising Canaan, those are our cars. So, yeah, those are our cars. I don't know if you watch Raising Canaan, but all those cars with the BBSs, those are our cars. Yeah, because they look at the really video classic. Um, yeah, those are our cars. If you if you look at the video. If you look at the video for Raising Canaan, you'll see me in the video with 50 driving in my blue Saab. That's 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 I'm that's our cars. Like all those cars in that video, that's that's our cars. That's my that's you know that's that's my companies. We provide all those cars, and also we're doing um we're we're doing paid in full too, which they're getting ready to start shooting. They're actually shooting it in Newark. So all the cars that you will see in paid in full too that's coming out, we're providing that too. So we're doing a, I'm doing a lot of big things with the, you know with the car that's that's always been one of my one of my loves you know the cars the bikes and the music so that's that's, that's always been my life that's what it is is Dame Dash behind the uh Peyton Ford too yep yep yes he is yep mm-hmm dope dope when's it supposed to release bro oh yeah you, you I have no idea you guys Dame that <laughs> I, that that one, I don't. He gotta finish shooting it first. He haven't even um, finished shooting it first. You gotta. I have no idea. You know what I mean, I would say, I'm, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say sometime at the end of the year or the beginning. I'm sorry, sometimes next year during the summer. 
if I had to guess, but honestly, I, I can't answer that. I have no idea. And this part two is supposed to be on Kevin Child's life, right? It's supposed it's supposed to be on um, from Dame's perspective, yeah, and Kevin Child's, yep, Kevin Child's perspective. Yep, that's exactly right. Yep. Hey, yo, Ghost. What up, Red? Oh, I just wanted to share the room. Hey, hey, yo, Thurl, I got a quick question, bro. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I get them to so, share the so, room, up, bro. So I want to ask you this, Y'all right? share the room. Share the room. So, so I want to ask you this. Right during the mixtape era, because we all heard the stories about Terror Squad and DJ Who Kid and stuff. How were you <laughs> able to maneuver? I know it's funny as shit. How were you <laughs> able to maneuver by putting artists' unreleased music on the mixtapes without getting caught up in the industry? Because motherfuckers was the villain yeah. that shit back I mean, in the day. I mean, a lot of people were sloppy. I'll just leave it at that. You know, you got to know how to move when you do that. You know what I mean? That's all I can say to that. I, you know, certain people was pro at it. Certain people were sloppy. And if you sloppy and come back to you, you're going to get caught up. Me, fortunately, I've had, I had, you know, I've had issues with people, but it never got to that. It never got physical, but I definitely had issues with people. And then we, we pieced it up and squashed it. But, you know, um, yeah, it's just, it's just how you do it. You, get, you, you can't be sloppy with it, you know? And that was a big thing back then, you know, getting exclusives. That was like whether you was going to make money or not, pretty much. That was like what mattered if someone was going to buy your tape or not. You had to have something that nobody had in order to sell a tape. So people would go through drastic measures. They would pay off the, they would pay off the engineer to get the music up. However they did it, but however you did it, you still got to be, you know, you got to be under the radar with it. You know what I mean? So a lot of people, they know how to move. Fortunately for me, I knew how to move and I just never had an issue. You know what I mean? I just never had that issue. Hey, bro, if you had to pick three artists, three, three of the hot younger artists right now who carry in the culture, what three would you pick? Three of the hot, hot artists right now? That you think going to carry the culture for this, for, this gener for this next generation right now? Um, wow, that's a great question. You mean three up-and-coming artists or three artists that's out right now or just ge in nah, general? three right now, like the three hottest right now that's going to carry the culture in the, the, this generation right here. Right now, oh man, let me see. Jeez. So, um, I would say this one, this kid from Harlem, this kid Castle Harlem. I would say if you know, if, you know, he's um, he's like an intellectual dude. You know, he got street rack. He got he got range. He got street records. He got he got um, he got music about the streets. He got music about the females. He got music for the clubs. You know, he's a talented dude. And and he writes for Cardi B. Uh, on top of that. So he's well, he's well, he well ranged, you know what I mean, when it comes to like music, you know. He can write for somebody and write for them and they don't, you won't know that he wrote it. Like he knows how to write for people. A lot of people, when, you put some, when they write for people, you could tell they didn't write that because you could tell who wrote it. But he knows how to write where it don't even sound like him. You know what I mean? Same way, my perfect example, Doc, um, you know the song Still, um, Still Dre Day, you know that record with Snoop, right? Everybody knows that record. Um, I'm still Dre, you know that? Dun, 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 yeah, 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 right. yeah. So, Jay Z wrote that, but you would never know that because he wrote it for Dre. It doesn't sound like a Jay Z. It doesn't sound like Jay Z wrote that. But Jay Z wrote that. Yeah, record. nah, that don't even sound like nothing Jay Z would say for it. That's that's my point. That's my point. That's my point. So artists that know how to write for people, but it don't sound like they wrote it. That's that's a that's a talent in itself. So. Definitely Castle Harlem. He knows he knows how to write for people, to where you don't you, you make you really believe that the artist wrote that, the way he write it. You know what I mean? And that's the that's the example I like to use. Jay Z Jay Z Jay Z Jay Z is that type of artist. He can write for somebody, and you would never know he wrote it. You would have no idea because he wrote it as if they were saying it. And like, you know I mean, it's believable that Dre wrote that, but obviously he didn't because he don't write. But that's my point. But I would say an artist like. Um, Castle Harlem, and even like female, you know, I'm big on female rappers, you know, and, and supporting them, like um, my homegirl Shanti McCoy, like she's, she's dope too. Um, she definitely has a lot of potential if she stays consistent. I hope she's listening to this, you know. My, my main problem with Shanti, she don't be consistent. She gotta be consistent, but you know, I love Shanti, she's dope. So I would definitely say Shanti McCoy, um, I mean, Castle Harlem, and um, you said three people. I don't really have three, man. Those are like two of the people that I that I um, that I always always um, supported, and I believe in them. And I and I know, given the right situation or the right record, right timing, they're gonna do something big. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Got you. And now that you now that you did the up and coming, give me your top your top three that's in the game right now. Like you know, like on the Dirk, Lil Baby, 
the baby, that type of level. What's oh. the top three for them? Oh, uh, little, you just named them. Uh, little baby, <laughs> little baby, the baby. And you know, Drake's still on top of his game, man. Like, you know, I gotta give it to him. He's still, he's still killing it, you know? Those, those, those are the, those are the top three that's, that's killing me in Little Dirt. Like, you, you, you just named it. You know, it is what it is. That's, that's who's right now killing the game. You, you went, you went you know? put Kodak, and, um, young boy in that, in that group. Yeah. Uh, above yeah. anybody, would you move anybody nah. around for Kodak, Hell young no. boy? Nah, I would not me personally. I wouldn't put Kodak. Let me tell you why. Kodak, see, that's popular, popular. There's, no, Kodak makes great music. I love Kodak Black, but he's not more talented than Lil Baby. Lil Baby's a spitter. He can spit. He, he, can, he can rap. Now, when you want to, now, if we're just talking about rapping, Little Baby versus Kodak, Kodak can't rap compared to Little Baby. He can't. He don't, he, he, he don't structure his stuff like Kodak. I mean, like um, Little Baby. He makes great music, but when we, I'm talking about, I like Little Baby because he can spit. I like Dub Baby because these are spitters. See, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm into spit, spitters. My favorite rapper is Big L. So that's the standard. When, when someone tells me they can rap, that's the standard I think about when you tell me you can rap. You, you better sound like Big L to me. If you say you can rap, you better come with some punchlines, some syllable twisting. Like you better sound like Eminem if you say you can rap. Like, so I wouldn't put Kodak no, nowhere near Lil Baby when it comes to rapping. Now making great music and the success he's had, of course, but even still, um, he's still not bigger than Lil Baby. You know what I mean? Nobody, like, Lil Baby's up there. You know what I mean? I, I was just wouldn't put him there yet. In, in my so opinion. What you, you know, think about Kevin? What you think about Kevin Gates? I like Kevin Gates. I like Kevin Gates. I think he's dope. He's dope. I, I like I like Kevin Gates, but I wouldn't. Once again, I wouldn't put him in a class with a little baby. I just wouldn't do it. He makes great music. I like his music, but he's not a little baby. He's just not. Hey, you said time. you interviewed the baby first, right? When you interviewed yeah. him back then, when he was baby Jesus, did you see the potential? Yeah, that's where what he's at now. Back you, then? I, listen, I encourage everybody right now. When you get off this, when we get off this, um. What we on? We on um. What, what are we on right now? We, we at Death of the Cloud Chase on Clubhouse. Clubhouse. Right. Well, we on Clubhouse. So if you got, whenever you get the time, go to YouTube and put the baby. You might you might have to put baby Jesus because that's what they labeled it back then. Baby Jesus. This is fifty. And look at that interview. I'm, he rapped and everything. And I said it right there. I was like, bro, you're gonna do something. I don't know what it is, but you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do something big. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. It's documented. It's right there for you to see on the internet. I said it. You know what I mean? I said it. And I and I remember what's funny. You know what's funny about this industry? I I see people now that's running behind him that I tried to put on to him and they wasn't trying. They wasn't listening. And now once they once he blew, they started calling me like, "Yo, you think you could get him to come up? You think you could get him to do that?" I'm like, "Nah, bro. He's not gonna do it because you spent them when I was trying to when I was trying to make it happen." So. That's one thing I learned, man. You you got you got you you never know who's gonna do something. You know what I mean? Like me, I was raised. I treat the janitor like the CEO. That's how I was raised. Everybody get the same respect for me. I don't care what your job title is or what you do. Everybody's gonna get the same respect for me. And that's how I treat artists. You know what I mean? I treat independent artists like they was Drake or whoever the, or Jay Z or whatever. I'm gonna treat them the same way. You know what I mean? So you go a long way if you if you if you handle people like that because you never know when you're gonna need those people. Hey, was, was, 50, was 50 interested in him at I got that a question time that goes. I'm sorry, go ahead. Was 50 interested um, in him at all at that time, bro? Well, once the interview came out, yeah, he was. That's my point. <laughs> yep, he definitely was. Once the interview came out and he, and he was rapping and he started making his noise, yeah, he was. Yep, he was. He's that, yep, he definitely was. You know, because people, people can't like what they don't see or hear. So you gotta put yourself out there, you know what I mean? But you gotta be good when you're on that stage. And 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 you know, and he heard him and he like his energy and you see he, he rocked with him. You know what I mean? But I'll be up on people way before that. Way before that. You know? So I and I, and I tell you, man, I pride myself on that. Like I, I just I could see, I could tell when somebody's gonna do something. I don't know how long it's gonna take, but I see it. Like I could tell they're gonna do something. I know they're gonna do something, and I told him that in that interview. Like I told him that. So yeah, that's that. So what do you think about the um, drill movement? Do you think it's gonna take over, or do you think it's gonna die down? 
Um, I, you know, my, my, my only issue with drill music, I like, I love, let me, let me just say this too before I say what I'm going to say. I love drill music. I love the whole movement. I love the sound because it's a different sound. What I hate about drill music, I hate the narrative. It's only talking about genocide, which is killing each other. There's other people we could be drilling on, you know what I mean? Like corrupt police, like the KKK, like the family of George Zimmerman. There's a lot of other people we could, we could be drilling on, like racists. You know, it's, it's only us we're drilling on. I just wish that narrative would change. That's my only issue with drill. We're only talking about killing each other. When there's a whole, if you're gonna kill somebody, there's a whole bunch of other people and, and a, a class of people you, should, you could kill too. You should be killing, actually. That's my problem with drill music. Mm, you know, Thank you, that um, was I, I came in a little late, so I don't know if y'all asked the question already. But was you around for the whole Snow Bucks uh, Summer Jam situation? The Snow and Bucks? If you, yeah. yeah. And um, you know that 50 Cent, you know, has sometimes a lot of controversy and beef. So what was the most outlandish thing that you saw or experienced while on tour or on stage? Yeah, once again, I, I for, fortunately, and I'm going to say fortunately, I was never around when anything did happen while I was with 50. It never, whenever something happened, I was never there. Like the Slow Bucks, I wasn't, I, I wasn't at that show. That was at Summer Jam. I wasn't there for that. I watched that like everybody else. From the, from the from the from the you know from the sidelines or the stage, from 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 TV or live streaming. I wasn't even at the stadium, so I just never experienced or been around anything dealing with drama or violence while I was with Fifty. I just I just never I just never was a, I just, it, it just it never happened when I was with him. Hey yo, Thorough, you got any K Slay stories? Rest in peace to Slay. Yeah, it's funny you said that. Um, before I get out of here, so I have a K Slay story. Not only that, I did K Slay's last interview. K Slay used my car for his um, for his video for, the, for this album that he has out. Um, it's actually, if you look at the the, um, the pictures, the picture that he's taking the, the car that he's taking a um, picture of, that's my car. So he used my car for a video for, for for one of his last videos, and I actually have the last K Slay interview in existence that I didn't put out yet. And um, I have the um, when we did the interview. This was like maybe four months before he passed away. Obviously, no one knows he's gonna pass away. This was before he even got sick. I had the footage and maybe for two months, he was saying, yo, I'm gonna come to your house to get the thumb drive. I'm gonna come get the, I'm gonna come get the footage. I'm gonna come get the footage. Well, he never came and got the footage. Next thing I know, he's in the hospital. And you know, I, and I, you know unfortunately, he passed away. So um, I have this interview with Case Slade that we did. And, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. And this is my point about giving people their flowers while they're here. So in that interview, while I was interviewing him, he was one of the people that I looked up to also in terms of the mixtape. And, I, and I, had to, I gave him his flowers. I had to stop the interview and I had to tell him like, yo, bro, I have a lot of love for you. You, you, know, you did a lot for the culture of um, hip hop. You're a, legend, you're a legendary graffiti artist. A lot of people don't know that. He was doing graffiti before he started DJing. He used to go by the name of Dez. He's a legendary graffiti artist. And I told him like, I just want to stop this interview and give you your flowers. You're somebody that matters to this culture. You're very important. And on, on, on behalf of me, in, in, in my platform, I want to give you your flowers. And I literally stopped the interview when I did that. And I just did that because that's how I truly felt. And I'm, and I'm, glad, I, I'm glad he got to hear that while he was living because so, so often we wait till people die, then we'll post them up, then we'll go, oh, that was my man. Oh, I had a love for him, I had love for him. Then they want to play their music all day, but they never do that when they're here. Like, you know what I mean? Like, then we name streets after them, we put their mural on the wall. We should do all that stuff while these people are here. You know what I mean? So I want to change that narrative too, or wait until people die to give them a street, uh, to name a street after them, or to put a mural up on them, or give them their flowers. Like, we got to stop doing that in this culture. We got to celebrate people while they're living. They need to hear it while they're here. So that's something else I want to work on. I, we need to work on as a culture of people. We need, to, we, need to, we need to praise our legends and people that inspire us while they're here. But that's my story with Kate Slade. So I so I have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. This is opinion again. I know you like DJing, but um, you know, as time goes on, we move in different directions. Do you since you do interviews? Do you see yourself doing like a no jumper? I think or a Vlad um, with the interviews that you know. You, did you, said, do I, you said, do I see myself being doing what Vlad do? Yeah, kind of, or like the... I can't even say it. Yes, like Vlad 
I'm sorry, red bars, so it may not be for me. Like the oh, you're breaking up. I'm sorry. Are the absences? Chuck, can you tell oh. us for me? She, she, she's up. breaking. She's breaking up. I'm sorry. I can't hear her. She's, she's saying like, do you mean a, she also doing like a podcast or like any shows? Like, oh yeah. Um, um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny you say that. I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm actually getting ready to start a podcast now, and it's called "Speak on It." Where's the lie? That's that's what it's called. It's, you know, where's the lie? Speak on it. Whatever. Um, so I'm literally getting ready to start a podcast, and that'll be that'll be um, launching um, next month. So um, look out for that. You know, and um, it's, it's self-explanatory. You know, as far as far as um, the format of it. You know, people are gonna come up there, and they're gonna speak on it. And and basically, where's the lie? You know what I mean? So expect a lot of feelings to get hurt on this podcast. But it's all you know, it's all truth. It's like where's the lie? And we're gonna speak on it. So that's that's I'm definitely I definitely have a podcast coming. Yes, definitely. Dope, dope. And before you get up out of here, let me ask you um, we, that Tony Yayo was recently on Math Hoffa, right? And um, he had said that Young Buck and Game should apologize to Fifty Cent, and um, they should go and make you know millions of dollars. Do you think that Fifty Cent would ever? You know, have a relationship with the game. Um, I don't want to speak for Fifty, but I'm just on you know, I'm on the outside looking in, just like everybody else. I would just say that um, anything's possible. You know what I mean? Him and Fat Joe made up. Uh, you know, people that beat for years make up. So anything's possible. Um, I don't think they're gonna be another G unit, in my opinion. Just you know, being on the outside looking in. But like I said, anything, anything's possible. I, me as a fan of the music, I wish they would make up and go on the road and get some money, and you know continue to provide for their families. And because the fans want to see that, a lot of a lot of times, with you know what beefing does, man, to me, it 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 it, 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 it discredits the legacy of music. Like there's a lot of music that people are never gonna hear or that's not gonna get made because people are, don't get along or they're beefing. So some of the some of the most classic music will never get made because people won't come together and do it. They don't like each other. And that's unfortunate. So on that, just speaking just about the music, I wish people would make up, come together, make some classic stuff, go on the road, sell out tours, you know, make the make the fans days and, and, and you know and continue that legacy of greatness, you know. But obviously I'm not 50, I can't speak for him. As a fan, that's what I wish. I wish they would make up. You know what I mean? However that however that has to go. I, and I wish they would go on the road. I wish there was another G unit. I wanna see them on tour. You know what I mean? I wanna go back on the road with them like that. That that'll be dope, but that's all that's on them. That's 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 my answer to that. Dope, dope. And um and let me ask you this, like when it comes to the culture, like right now, you know it's a lot of rappers that's catching Ricos as well as a lot of rappers that's dying. Like what do you think the state of um hip hop is right now? Uh so repeat that question again. I'm sorry, say it again. Like right now we got a lot of rappers that's catching Ricos mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of rappers that's dying. Like um like what's your opinion on like the state of hip hop when it comes to that? Um, my, my opinion on that is people need to learn how to separate the street from music. Um, it's, it, too often we see it, you know, you, you, you try to get out of these impoverished environments to do something, you know. When you get out of these impoverished environments, why would you continue to, to, to be involved in the same stuff you're trying to get out of? That's the part that we have to learn as a people to stop doing. Like, so, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of self stitching in music. It's a lot of you know, ignorance in the music, we celebrate, we, like for instance, somebody had died, we'd be like, oh, that's fucked up. But we celebrate the music that was talking about killing somebody. So it's like a contradiction. And we all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it, everybody's guilty of it. You know, th there needs to be a balance with that. You know what I mean? Like, um, and hip hop is not all about violence and, 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 you know, there's other formats of hip hop. You know what I mean? There's other artists that don't talk about street stuff that we need to start celebrating. It just needs to be balanced. Hip hop don't need to be all positive and it don't need to be all negative. It just needs to be balanced, you know what I mean? And people need to learn not to bring their real life street shit into music if they're still actually out in the street and then get surprised when you get busted with a Rico. You know, that's, that's, that's my take on that, you know what I mean? You gotta change the narrative of music making. Got yeah. you, got you. And um, you know, if you, if you don't mind, can you Church give us a drop? I now we he's about to go um just give us one second mm -hmm. uh can you give us a drop like far as um death of the cloud chaser oh death of the cloud chaser that's the name of the show right yep yep all right whenever whenever you're ready. ready i'll do it 
You know what it is, man. It's DJ Thoreau, a.k.a. Thoreau Zano, the bridge to the streets. And right now you're checking out the death of a clout chaser right here. Check it out. Let's go. Salute, salute. That was dope. That was dope, bro. And uh, she she had one last question before you go, if you yep. can answer that for her. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I like to ask people, and Chuck, thank you for having him on the platform, and thank you for inviting me to the stage, but COVID, did COVID change your mindset, you know, because during COVID, a lot of things changed for a lot of people, did it change your mindset, did it inspire you to go in different directions, or do you, did you just pick up where you left off? Uh, yeah, true. COVID definitely changed my mindset. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, it, it taught me though. You always gotta have something going on. You gotta, you gotta have other things going on because if you can't DJ or if you got something that you're dependent on, you gotta have, you gotta have many, many avenues of, many, many revenues, of, of, of um, excuse me, many avenues of, of, of revenue coming in. You can't just rely on one thing. COVID definitely taught me that because you know I was doing a lot of DJing going overseas. So when I stopped, I was literally doing nothing. So. During that time, this is when I started forming my, my um, classic car company or whatever. And um, it taught me that. It was, it was kind of partly, res you know, helped me birth, you know, my, my company. So it was good and bad, you know what I mean? I stopped DJing, but then I, st but then I um, created my company, BBS Boys, out of, the, out of the pandemic. But that's what it taught me. You got to have more than one thing going on to make it, to, 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 you know, you should have more than one thing going on. Nah, I was going to ask you, um, do you think that, in the future, it'll be like more not for profits and stuff like that for the kids that want to out and that can be music because I see that they put them in the prisons and everything like studios and stuff. So, do you think we could reach the community before they get to that point? Yeah, we um I actually deal with um my guy Wayne from PCNY and we it's a non it's a non profit organization and we go basically we give um um book bags to the kids. You know, we, um, we we go around with the cars. You know, let them sit in the cars, uh, take pictures, and and try to provide um, you know community center events and and things of that nature. But yeah, there's a lot that can, still needs to be done. But that that should be happening. That should be happening. But also the labels of these artists that you know, like every artist from your neighborhood, you, you should be reaching out to your labels and you know trying to bring give back to the community. You know, I pride myself on trying to do that too. But you know, I'm just one person. It, it got to be a collective. Um, has to be a collective thing, but yeah, that that's something that's 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 being done on, on large and big scales. It just we just need more of it. it. But it's definitely effective. It keeps a lot of kids kids out of the street and gives them something else to look forward to. You know what I mean? So definitely. And we'll end it with this one. Um, we got a good question in the chat. It says like, um, how how do you want to be remembered? I just want to live a legacy of greatness behind. I want to be known as a person that always extended itself. Always try to help people, respectful, and just, you know, um, good energy, free-spirited person. That's how I want to be remembered, you know what I mean? That's how I want to be remembered. Someone that tried to, to help people and wanted the best for people that I'm around and just in general. And I just want to leave a legacy of greatness behind for my family and my kids. That's how I want to be remembered. Salute, salute, man. We appreciate you stopping by, bro, giving us some All of right. your time. Yeah, thank, thank you for thank having you. me. All yeah, right. Yo, yo, um, Daryl. Yeah. Yo, um, give them your info again, bro. Yeah, you can follow me at um at DJ Thoro. That's T H O R O. Um, that's on IG. That's 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 my platform I use. So, if you want to get at me, shoot me a DM. I'll respond back. I'm proactive on there. I get back to everybody. I don't take none for granted. Everybody that's on this um feed right now, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. You could have been on anybody else's, but you're here. And I appreciate that. Thank you. I take nothing for granted. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All right. Salute. Salute. All right. Salute. Right, salute. Y'all have a good day. You too, bro. All right. Peace. 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 peace.